So I would like to introduce Dr. Alistair Moore from Imperial College London, who will be presenting on a speech de-reverberation for human and machine listening. And hand over to Ali. Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, that's the topic, speech de-reverberation for human and machine listening. Um, before I get into the topic fully, I thought I'd show you a picture of where I work. Um, this is Imperial College London, and it's a photo taken at night because everything looks nice at night. In the daytime, it looks concrete and horrible. Um, but I work in that office there. Uh, there's quite a few of us in the lab, um, some of whom have contributed to this presentation in their own ways, especially uh, my boss, Patrick Naylor, and a colleague, Christine Evers. Um, so, <coughs> what is the effect of reverberation, or more specifically, the distance between a sound source and the microphone that records them? We have a recording here made in a fairly reverberant church. And I want you to see if you can understand what's being said. Any guesses? Got as far as because mankind. Yeah. <laughs> Would you all agree it was definitely speech? Yeah. And it was all reverberant speech. Okay, so we know that much about it, but we know that, so I've proven the first point, which is too much reverberation is a bad thing for speech, which I guess as a Christian as you all know, but um, it's particularly problematic when um, we have phones and all sorts of other stuff. I'll try and get a bit closer and see if we can work out what's actually being said. And why? Because mankind is loved to watch stuff like that since mankind began. Any advancement on yeah. not a lot? Okay. A little bit. And, and why? Because mankind has loved to watch stuff like that since mankind began. That's reasonably intelligible, I think. <laughs> but just so you can. And why? Because mankind has loved to watch stuff like that since mankind began. So, all those recordings were made at the same time, in the same space, and the only thing that was different was which microphone was being used to record it. So, we often consider reverberation time to be the problem, whereas in actual fact it's not really the time that's the problem, it's the, the balance of reverberant sound to the direct sound that we are worried about. And this is something that's a problem when we have distant um, microphones. So. There's two application areas really to, um, there's, there's two situations really where reverberation is a problem. Um, for human listening, yeah, and this one, we have a lot of hands-free communication going on these days where we have quite a significant dis distances between the talker and the microphone. Um, so for the person on the other end of the phone, that um, reduces the perceived quality, it makes it, um, you know, more effort is required to listen, and intelligibility, as we've heard, in the worst case, can go down as well. For this chap over here, so for machine listening, it's all about word error rate. That's the only thing that actually matters. But it is very true that even with a small amount of reverberation, the quality of uh, automatic speech recognition goes down dramatically. And it's a lot of the application areas that we're looking at is in this sort of machine listing um, situation. So the solution is speech de reverberation, um, which is generally all about how we can estimate the dry sound from one or preferably more noisy reverberant observations of it. And we will try and exploit some of this stuff. Um, knowledge of how the sound is um, propagated in the room, um, what directions the sound is arriving from, and the statistical properties of the signal itself. So, to give you a general outline of this talk, I'll start off with some definitions that I'm guessing as acquisitions you're all going to be really familiar with, so we'll rush, we'll get through them pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to introduce the topic of beamforming, which is the most classic of um, speech enhancement methods. Um, then channel equalisation and multi-channel linear prediction is the two topics that I'm wor working on most um, recently myself. 
and then we'll look at a few of the applications that we have um, when we're actually doing this stuff for real. So this diagram is thanks to one of our PhD students. Um, I think it's quite nice because it shows pretty much everything that's going on in our acoustic environment. So the, the big blue, um, blue? That's green. Uh, the big green um, ball is the desired source. And the thing that we most care about is this bit here, which is the direct path. So that's the clean, if you like, observation of this, uh, the source signal. But we have reflections off the walls, which in our research at least, we almost always assume are specular reflections that can be modeled using image sources. So they have distinct directions as well. There can be directional noise sources. So this is just another source that's interfering with what we want to listen to. And then we have this general isotropic noise field, so diffuse noise that surrounds the microphone, or preferably microphone array. Uh, so looking at the desired source in particular, we have the direct path and the reflections, which can be um, well captured with the room impulse response. Could everyone nod if you're intimately familiar with the room impulse response? Does everyone encounter these in your daily lives? some nodding a lot more than others. Okay, so basically we have the direct path, we have some other reflections, and we have the reverberant tail, which is the bit where everything's a bit of a mush. Uh, and using this um, uh, finite impulse response, we can divide it into sections. If we take the ratio of the energy in the direct path to everything else, that's the direct to reverberant rate ratio. And if we take a bit more up front and a bit less in the back, that gives us the clarity index. And this is important because there are psychoacoustic studies which basically show that actually the first 50 milliseconds or so that follow the direct path contribute positively to intelligibility. So to say that we want just the direct path is not necessarily always the best. Actually having a little bit that follows it can be good. And we'll see um, some applications of that later. So from the impulse response, which is that one there, we can create the energy decay curve, which is just the amount of energy that's left in the room, if you like. So the slope of this, of this line here tells us about how fast the energy is decaying. And the, basically the height of this initial drop is basically the direct to reverberant ratio. So what we would like are large drops here and steep lines here in order to um, minimize the effective reverberation. So going back to our initial, initial um, of keeping in mind this diagram, there are a few different models that we have for sound propagation and that we can use for um, speech enhancement of de-reverberation. The first one is the um, acoustic impulse response model. So this is the convolution of this impulse response with SN, which is our desired source, the desired speech, and then we have additive noise. So this re represents the two forms of um, distortion that we can have to a signal, which is additive distortion and convolutive. With additive distortion, ideally you would just subtract it. With convolutive distortion, it's not as simple as that, which is why the reverberation is a challenging problem. Another model we can look at is the sum of plane waves. So this is where if we treat each of the reflections as an individual source, we can see the signal that we receive as being the sum of many individual sources coming from different directions at different times. So this, is a, this can be helpful when we want to exploit the early reflections in the um, enhancement process. And the final model, which is the simplest of all, is where we assume all the noise is actually additive. So at the microphone, we have the speech with some coefficient beforehand, which is important because it tells us how much level scaling there is, but also the phase scaling. And the subscript M's here, in each case, refers to the microphone. And so if you have a, a number of microphones, each will have a slightly different phase relationship, which is something that can be exploited in enhancing the signal which is exactly what we do in beamforming. So the beamforming approach. We have a direct sound, which is the one that we want. 
we have sound coming from other directions, which is what we don't want. And the idea is to use directional selectivity to listen particularly in one direction and try and attenuate all other directions. So this is a general overview of how it works. We have our plane wave arriving from the one direction and it's picked up at the four microphones which leads to slight delays between the different signals that are received. Here we apply just a time variation, so a time delay, so that we line the signals up and then we, when we add them together what happens is the stuff that is coherent between the different microphones gets summed coherently and the stuff that's noise gets summed incoherently and so we get an improvement in the signal to noise ratio of the desired speech to the, uh, uh, to the background noise or reverberation. In this case the transformation by this, these, these, are, these are filters effectively which are just very simple filters where they have a delay. We can have more complex filters which include both magnitude and phase. But the underlying performance of what we call the delay sum beamformer, this very simple beamformer, gives us a directivity pattern that looks like this. So in this case we have a, the loop direction is 60 degrees, so this is, represents what we want to listen to. And you can see that uh, there is a, what's called the main lobe, which is everything that's near the desired direction that's passed. And then we have nulls and we have what's called side lobes. And ideally we'd have very low level side lobes and very narrow beams. We also have a lobe that's um, this, this symmetry, if you like, of this one, because this is a uniform linear array. So it has no ability to, to discriminate between things that are actually symmetric. Uh, we can improve the performance of any microphone array by adding more microphones. What that does is it makes the main lobe narrower. Excellent. We can also make the spacing wider, which makes the main lobe, lobe narrower, but introduces the problem that we call spatial aliasing which is where you start having additional lobes that are at a high level, which is due to the different the wavelength of the signal compared to the spacing of the microphone. Okay. So these results are for, uh, yes, yeah, so this is the, um, the spatial aliasing. These results are for a linear array. Now, what I spend most of my time working with is spherical arrays. Now, the nice thing about a spherical array is that because the microphones are in three dimensions, they're not coplanar, we can steer a beam in any direction without any of these symmetrical um, uh, ambiguities. I could talk about this microphone for quite some time. It costs about £20,000. It's 32 microphones in it, and we use it for a lot of our research. Um, the reason, one of the nice things about a spherical microphone array is that you can transform from the microphone signals into a different representation um, based on spherical harmonics. Have you come across ambisonics? There is some nodding. So ambisonics is a bit of a dirty word in some respects in that it's quite, or it can be poorly defined. People mean different things when they talk about ambisonics. So I don't intend to talk about ambisonics. There are two parts of ambisonics. There is the representation of the signal based on the spherical harmonics, all of which is mathematically defined and correct. And then there's how you represent, how you, how you reproduce amb an ambisonic signal, signal, which is a bit more vague and a bit more based on psychoacoustics and a lot less consistent. So everything I'm going to talk about is based on the first half of it, which is representing a sound field based on spherical harmonics. These diagrams might look a bit different to what you normally see for spherical harmonics. That's because these are complex spherical harmonics rather than real spherical harmonics. You can transform between the two quite easily, but for some reason in the spherical microphone array literature, the complex spherical harmonics are the ones that tend to be used, and we've inherited that. But it doesn't really matter which one you use. You can transform between the two. The nice thing about working in spherical harmonics is that it doesn't actually matter what the 
geometry of the original array was too much. There are some caveats to that, but in general, if you can capture something and transform it to the spherical amount domain, then you can use the same algorithm to enhance it regardless of what the microphone looked like in the first place, which is also something that's important for us, as you'll see later. The, with spherical harmonic domain beamforming, it's the same kind of principle as with the microphone domain, of the space domain, but now what we're doing is we have a weighted sum of the spherical harmonic rather than of the microphone signals themselves. And you end up with beam patterns that look like this, where you see that they are, um, there's a single direction that is the main lobe, which is what we want. Uh, are there any questions at this stage on beam forming? <laughs> there's some smiling, I'm not sure what that means. That's all going away, it's all lost, or it's all uh, making perfect sense. Okay, so. Beamforming is a approach which, as we said, we get some spatial spatial selectivity, but it doesn't actually do any de-reverberation, as we might call it in the typical sense that all we're doing is we're listening in one direction, but the reverberation that's from that direction we pass completely um, unmodified, so we retain that reverberation. What we really like to do is actually attenuate that as well, so we actually reduce the reverberation rather than just being spatially selective. And that is the goal of multi-channel equalization. So this is a block diagram of a multi-channel equalization system. Hopefully, so on the left hand side what you can see is this, the acoustic impulse responses from our source to our microphones which are <coughs> nominally here and we have some noise at each microphone. So this is the first signal model we looked at, the convoluted model. The whole basis of this approach is that somehow we can make get an estimate of what these filters are. This requires system identification, which is a very challenging problem because really it needs to be done blind, otherwise there's no point. So this little dotted line here, we don't have this, do we? all we have is the signals that arrive here. And the challenge there is to estimate what these filters are. Uh, that is currently an unsolved problem, I would say. Some people are working very hard to try and solve it, and there are various strategies and things that are going on, uh, not least in my lab. But as of yet, it is not a problem that we can solve well. We can solve it to some extent, so we can, we can estimate these filters, but to say that we can estimate them perfectly is a long way from the truth. Nevertheless, we would like to be able to use these estimates to design a set of filters, one filter per input channel, such that when we sum the outputs, what we get is a perfectly equalized signal. So we take away all the reverberation, and we end up with just an impulse, or just as the original signal. So here we have this dry speech input, and here we have the estimated dry speech. But to design these, what we don't do, we, we don't use speech there. We, we, because we have these, we can use these in their raw state, assuming that there is an impulse in, we can expect an impulse out. So that's what this slide is showing. So this is the classic, very first approach to doing multi-channel equalization. So here we have some estimated or measured impulse responses. And what we want is to find the filters here which means that the output is exactly an impulse. Uh, that can be solved using a bit of math, which is all very nice. But what effectively we're doing is we're taking an energy decay curve that looks like that and trying to, trying to make it into that. Then what we can do is we can apply the speech that we had in, in the first place um, through these filters and we should get a de-reverberated signal. <coughs> Unfortunately, this doesn't, this doesn't work very well. Um, the problem is that because we have errors in these estimates, these filters are wrong, and so this is terrible, doesn't work very well. So what we want is to be able to have a slightly more forgiving method, that even though there are some errors in the estimates, 
we can still get some effective dereverberation. And the way that we do that is to accept that the early reflections actually are positive, you know, they help intelligibility. And so we can kind of say, well, let's leave them where they are and only attenuate the late tail. And that leads to this algorithm called the relaxed multi-channel least squares, um, where the key point here is that here, rather than having a single Dirac impulse, we have, a num we have an unconstrained set of taps. So we are, we're allowing the energy in that um, initial early period. So this means that we end up with an energy decay curve that looks more like that. So it starts off with a decline, and then it drops more rapidly. So the advantage of this is that, as I said, it's more robust for channel estimation errors. But it does lead to some coloration in the signal that you get out because of these unconstrained early taps. There are new methods that are being researched just now and recently being published that improve on that. But this is the method that I've got for the demonstration here. So my contribution to all this is to say, can we improve upon this by doing some spatial pre-processing, particularly for spherical microphone arrays? Which is what that says. So the idea here is that we want to see if taking these channel estimates that we have, can we apply a transformation so we can apply a filter so that combining many input channels, we produce one channel that has some spatial selectivity or some spatial properties that might be beneficial. And then can we do that multiple times to give us a whole new set of channels? So these H primes are transformed channels that have some sort of different property to the original channel that we had. And there's three different types of processing that we looked at. One is none, none at all, so the baseline, just take it as it was. So that would be, this is a one and these are all zeros, so we pass one channel straight through. The other is to use what we call eigenbeam channels. So this is the spherical harmonics that we saw before. And the third is to actually form beams and point them in sensible directions. So that we're using beam forms channels rather than the microphone channels. So just to go through quickly what they are by definition, this is the microphone channel. We are, so it's the impulse response from the source to the into, I was going to say here, the Qth microphone. And we have capital Q microphones. This is the baseline condition, and for a rigid bodied microphone array, there is some spatial directivity due to the rigid array, but there's not very much. The next is the eigenbeam channels. That's the math for how it all works. But the important point is that we have the microphone channels at the input, and we have the eigenbeam channels at the output, and Somewhere in the middle, we have spherical harmonics. Um, and the spherical harmonics range, we order them by the order and the degree. So we have this is zeroth order, first order, second order, and degree zero, one, or minus one, one, minus one, one, minus two, minus two. Um, and then to make, get the directed beams, we take the, our eigenbeam channels and we weight them to form the beams, uh, where the weighting is related to the loop direction. So by using the desired directions, we can form beams that look in different directions, and each one of them is a channel uh, with Z. So that's one beam, and using multiple beams, we have multiple channels. So in a little experiment, we compared these three configurations. They were the raw microphone channels, which we call EM32, the 16 eigenbeam channels, which we call IG16, and the seven beamform channels. The seven becomes, comes because we have the direct path and we have six first order reflections. So that's the reflections that have bounced off one wall only. And this is the result. Uh, there's a lot going on there, but if we look at the solid lines first of all, they represent the unprocessed signal. So um, the, this is the energy decay curve of the, the non-dereverberated signal, if you like. So both the space domain, so the channel 32 ones, and the IG16 
are the basically the this line here. Because the eigenbeam processing doesn't do any deep reverberation, so it's still the same. The beam BF7 original, if you look, has a big drop here, which is the point I made earlier about having spatial selectivity means that you get an improvement in the direct reverberant ratio um, just by doing the spatial selectivity. When we get to 50 milliseconds, we see this drop that we're expecting from the energy decay curve due to the de reverberation process. And we see that the drop is greatest for the beam form channels. So that's showing just uh, the full energy decay curve qualitatively. If we look at the C50, you can, um, over a number of different trials, you can see that the um, so the blue is the channels, that's the eigenbeams, and that's the beamform channels. So the microphone channels and the eigenbeam channels are roughly the same, but we get an improvement with the beamform channels. And if you look at the dereverberated version, we see that we get an improvement in both of these pre-processed um, forms. And that's due to the fact that we are increasing the what we call the spatial diversity between the channels. Where you have lots of microphones very close together, they're picking up something that's very similar. But by doing this pre-processing, what we're doing is we're separating the signal out into, um, we're making each channel less like each other, which makes it easier to invert, which gives us, gives us the better result. And with longer um, reverberation times, we get pretty similar results, really but just not quite so good. Interestingly, we get much more variability with the beamforming channels than we do with the other ones. And the reason for that is because for the different trials, we have different source and receiver positions. And for some configurations, it is the case that the direct path and an earlier reflection might come from a similar direction. In which case, when you steer a beam at the direct path and one at the reflection, you get almost exactly the same result, or almost the same thing which means we're not actually increasing the spatial diversity in the way that we hope to. So for this method to go further, it requires a slightly more intelligent way of picking which reflections to steer the beams towards. So, to conclude multi-channel equalization, uh, yeah, so if we have a perfect estimate of the impulse response, then we can get a perfect result. All very good. Unfortunately, we can't. We don't have that, but we can um, still achieve effective de reverberation. Uh, and uh, most importantly, the, the um, spatial pre processing can improve the results. And one day, someone will, invent, someone will invent some good system identification that means all these methods can be put into practice for real. So, Having talked a bit about something that would be very like, nice to do but we can't do yet, I'm going to talk about something that we uh, is very nice we can do, which is far more inspiring. Um, and this is the principle of linear prediction. Can I get a general nod or murmur of if linear prediction is something that you've come across at any point in your life? A couple of nods. Heard of it even? No. Okay, so I'm not going to try and go through the full maths of linear prediction because it's uh, at least three lectures in the speech processing course to do linear prediction, so um, it's quite a big topic. But the general idea behind linear prediction is that we can use previous observations of a signal to predict what the future um, signal will be like. Okay? That is what we call an autoregressive process. So have you come across infinite impulse response filters? Lots more nodding there. OK. So it's basically saying we're going to take the output of a system and feed it back in itself. That's, so uh, an autoregressive process is one that's amenable to linear prediction. So um, basically, in a very simple case, this bit in the middle here is saying that we can predict the second or the index two value of a sample based on two coefficients multiplying the previous two sample values. 
And we can do that for the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one. In each case, using the same coefficients to with multiplied by the, the previous two samples. That gives us a set of linear um, uh, simultaneous equations that can be solved. And the solution to that is our linear prediction filter, effectively. Um, so, if that IIR filter, that linear prediction filter, is applied to the observed signal in the previous time, then we can get our predicted value. We can also take what we know to be the true value, and the difference between them is the error signal, which we call the linear prediction residual. Um, and if we do a little bit of math, we can turn it all around so that actually we can get the linear prediction residual by a finite impulse response filter. So even though the infinite impulse response filter may not be stable, the, the uh, finite impulse response filter is stable, and what it does is it tells us the bit of our signal that's not predictable. So how does this all relate to reverberation? In a room, because we have reflections off walls, it is the case that the reflections arriving later are related to the original signal, and therefore there is some predictable qualities involved there. So what we want to do is use linear prediction to remove the bit of the signal which, which, which is predictable, because that's the reverberation, to be left with only the bit that's not predictable, which is the interesting bit, which is the speech. Hopefully that makes sense, um, which is what this says here. Um, yep, so we're removing resonances effectively. Uh, the difference between linear prediction of speech and linear prediction for reverberation is that the time scales are massively different. So in linear predictions for speech, we take frames that are of the order of 100 milliseconds or multiple frames of 30 milliseconds long, that sort, of, that sort of amount. And over that duration, we can assume that the signal itself is stationary, which simplifies the estimation. And we say that the prediction filter is changing on that time scale. So we're tracking changes in the, in the filter. For a room, we expect the reverberation time to be way longer than that, so you know, up to a second or so, but not changing. But on the other hand, we know for a fact that the speech signal that's the input to that, its level is changing a lot. So the, um, for reverb for the reverberation, what we, we need to introduce some extra terms to the problem, which I'm not going to go into the math of it, but they are basically um, awaiting, yeah, based on the estimated speech energy, um, and yeah, and the other thing is that the um, we can do linear prediction on speech, and we get a signal that's effectively white noise-like or periodic. If we do linear prediction on reverberant speech, we could end up with a signal that's white noise-like or periodic, because we <coughs> remove all the resonances, and we don't want to do that. We only want to remove the resonances that are from the room. So the way to avoid that is by using what's called delayed linear prediction, where the input signal that you use for the prediction is actually delayed by more than one sample. It's delayed by about 30 or 40 milliseconds, which means that you can't you can't predict the first part of it, so which avoids us what's called the over whitening. Right, we'll crack on with the uh, general principle is that we have a received signal, we have the desired signal, which is the uh, the dry speech with the early reflections, so this the initial part. We have the late reverberation, which is correlated and undesired, and we have additive noise. Uh, so the desired signal is the linear prediction residual, <laughs> okay. um, which is basically the same. This is basically the same expression that we had on the previous slide, and the whole point of this is that we want to estimate G, which is the linear prediction filter, and for that we use an algorithm called the weighted prediction error. 
um, which is an iterative algorithm which alternately estimates this filter and then estimates the, sp um, the energy in the speech. And then based on knowing the energy or estimating the energy in the speech, re-estimates the filter and back and forth. So our desire is to apply this algorithm in the spherical harmonic domain and see how we get on. Um, one of the reasons for doing it in the spherical harmonic domain is that we want to use as many microphones as we can because that gives us more information. But the more microphones we have, the more coefficients, the more filter, filter taps we need in order to uh, get the output. Um, but by using more filter coefficients, we have more computational complexity. And so the point of this bit of work is to show that by going in, by using a spherical microphone array and processing in the spherical harmonic domain, we can get the benefits of more microphones without having any more computational complexity. So in this experiment, we compared four, eight, and 32 channel microphone arrays and processing in the space domain, so the microphone signals directly, and the um, spherical harmonic domain signals. So this is the, a plot of the computation time by the number of coefficients. Um, we have the spherical harmonic domain processing and the space domain processing. And we see that this one here, this is the 32 channels in the space domain, the computational complexity is way up here because we need lots and lots of coefficients in order to implement the filter. Whereas if we only have four channels, either in the space domain or the spherical harmonic domain, we're down here. But importantly, the spherical harmonic domain signals are all still down here because we still only use four channels in the spherical harmonic domain. So I should probably, I'm not sure I've made this quite, quite clear. Regardless of the number of channels we have, number of microphone channels we have, we always convert to the same number of spherical harmonics. So we have the same amount of pro pro computational cost. Um, now when we have a high SNR, so 20 dB SNR, what we see is the performance, <coughs> I'll talk about this in a minute, is reasonably similar. So the baseline with no processing is pretty similar. And the DRW signals are all better, but they're not that different depending on how many microphone channels we have. As we reduce the signal to noise ratio, so there's more noise present, it becomes <coughs> harder to estimate the spherical harmonics because each signal is corrupted. So it becomes beneficial to have more microphones. And when we get down to 0 dB SNR, we can see that th with 32 microphones, we're doing much better than we are with either eight or four, even in the unprocessed case. But with the processing, we get even more benefit. And the key result really from this is that we can achieve with much less processing in the spherical harmonic domain, what takes much more processing in the space domain if we do it with 32 channels rather than four channels in the spherical harmonic domain. So, by doing linear prediction-based de reverberation in the spherical amount domain, we can get effective de reverberation even at poor, S poor signal to noise ratios than com and at low computational complexity compared to what we can if we work in this microphone domain or the space domain. Right, that's me done with theory. Now for some pretty pictures and some um, more applications type stuff. So the first thing that we're working on, and we have been for a little while, is robot audition. So the goal of this project is to produce a working prototype of a robot that can work or operate as a hotel receptionist, so in a hotel lobby. So this was conceived as being a place which is quite active. There's lots of things going on potentially quite reverberant because it will be a big space, lots of glass surfaces, and in which there are some fairly predictable questions and sort of some, 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 some example conversations that we can have which are plausible but also relatively constrained. Uh, 
so the various problems that one might want to solve in this sort of situation are right at the top the most important is blind speech to reverberation but there's also things like room inference do we know where we are environment mapping can we work out where the walls are where the different sound sources are uh, speech enhancement for recognition acoustic slam is quite a big one that's a very new thing it's so slam is simultaneous localization and mapping so the idea is that can you work out where in the room you are whilst at the same time not knowing where what the room looks like and as you learn more about the room you can learn more about where things are and therefore where you must be in relation to it and you can build a map it's been a big thing in video for a long time so you can have a video of moving through a scene and you can build up a map of the scene and the same thing is becoming possible with audio as well um, I should name check Christine Evers for that, that's um, her thing um, so one of the big things about the project was basically to take the robot head and make it into a spherical microphone array so I said at the start about how the, one of the benefits of spherical harmonic domain processing is that we don't have to care what the, what the microphone array geometry is because the same algorithms will work for whatever. So in this project what's happened is we've been developing spherical harmonic domain algorithms before the head's even been available yet, knowing that at the end of the day the signals that we get will be converted into a form that our algorithms can be applied. So this is a, um, a wire mesh of the head of a narrow robot showing the 12 microphone positions that were uh, chosen as being optimal for being able to convert from the space domain into the spherical harmonic domain despite the very irregular geometry of the head. This is a nice CAD drawing of the actual um, prototype again showing the microphones positions and as part of the project, the commercial par partner actually developed a new microphone board and did a fair bit of work making the quality of the microphone signals better as well as just their position better for us. Um, one of the things we've been able to do in the spherical amount domain is um, direction of arrival estimation. So this is showing three sound sources all continuously moving with their positions being estimated in on using 250 milliseconds of audio every 100 milliseconds. And you can see that, for the most part, most of the estimates are pretty good in relation, relation to, to the black lines, whereas there's a few that are what we call clutter measurements. And the idea is that by taking these raw direction of arrival estimates, we can then do tracking to actually track moving sound sources in an environment. But this talk is about deep reverberation. So I'm going to play some examples of linear prediction based de reverberation using a four microphone head, which is what we had access to before the last few months when the was letting available. So at 30 dBs an hour, everything sounds quite nice. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. So you can hear some kind of chatter background noise and you can hear it's clearly very reverberant. But you can understand it, and it doesn't sound that bad in terms of perceptually, you wouldn't mind listening to that. Uh, with deep reverberation. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. So this is, this is the reverberant signal again. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. So you can hear that it's really quite effective. It's definitely reducing all of that latent reverberation. One of the benefits of the linear prediction method that I didn't really go in that mentioned too much was the fact that the output is as many channels as what you had on the input. So unlike multi-channel equalization, where what you do is you take all the channels and squeeze them into one channel and one result, the output of this deep reverberation is the same number of channels you had in the input. So you can then do beamforming afterwards. So we still have the spatial selectivity available to us, which is what this one does. 
The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. And then just because we can, we can apply, apply some conventional noise reduction to it as well. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. So we've gone from this. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. Um, I'll play you the target, but it's not really a fair um, comparison because it doesn't include the uh, response to the loudspeaker, which we have no way of removing that. So it's what will they say? This is. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage so, guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. It sounds completely different, but you can hear how, hear how dry that is. So, now the much more challenging problem of zero dB SMR. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. So that's pretty bad. So when the noise is quite high, you can't really hear necessarily the, how, quite how effective the deer reverberation is. But if we keep going and try and get rid of some of the background noise. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. So we're going from this received signal. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. To this. The Toronto-based company provides mortgage guarantees to the Canadian real estate industry. And that's all completely blind, so there's no prior information given to that. We know the geometry of the microphones, um, although actually we don't really use that even. So, and we just use very simple direction of arrival estimation, or time delay of arrival estimation. So you work out what the optimum um, delays are for the beam forming part, but that's the only bit we have to estimate in length. Um, and I hope you'll agree it's quite effective. Um, I can't show you the results for the word error rate improvements, um, they're quite significant, um, but they're not being published yet, so I have to wait for that. And the other thing I want to talk about a little bit quickly is uh, hearing aids, which if you think about a robot, it can move uh, in its environment. A person moves so much faster <laughs> and so much more spontaneously than a robot. With a robot, we can potentially can control how and when it moves. With a human, we kind of have to just put up with whatever movements happen to be there. Um, so this is a project that has actually just started, so we haven't got any results to show. Um, but you can imagine some of the problems. Um, a cocktail party environment where we have lots of different type sound sources, particularly babble noise, which is particularly hard to remove because it, the properties of babble are the same as the properties of the speech signal that you want. So choosing which is which is quite hard. Um, Direction of arrival estimation is going to be quite key to this because we can form beams and choose to listen in certain directions only. Hearing aids currently form beams generally directly to the front based on the generally reasonable assumption that you're listening to the person who's in front of you and if you're not you'll turn to look at them. But it doesn't really follow so much in a group situation because you know you're moving your head back and forth but when you have a conversation, you don't always look at the person that's talking. Uh, also, you, you have to, when you make a, design a beam former, you have some control over how wide the beam is. Now, if you make a really narrow beam, you'll get much better enhancement, but if you're not looking in the right direction or you're not steering in the right direction, actually what you're doing is you're attenuating what you want to listen to. So one of the challenges of the project is and as a result, conventional hearing aids have these massive wide beams that help, 
you know, remove stuff from that's behind you, but they don't really get rid of the noise from in front of you. So one of the ideas, one of the points is to try and use the work that we have done on uh, acoustic scene awareness to have a real time um, idea of where the sound sources are so that we can form good beams. Um, another thing is that with noise reduction to get significant improvements in, ten in intelligibility you have to be quite aggressive with your signal processing which generally means non-linear um, processing which has a tendency to sound pretty terrible um, and so there can be a trade-off between inte intelligibility improvement versus the perceived quality and speech distortion and so one of the aims of the project will be to be able to, to do both at the same time ideally to be able to get an improvement in intelligibility while still maintaining perceived quality and part of the, that work is working in collaboration with UCL where they're doing some uh, listening tests with some hearing impaired people to actually model hearing loss and together we're going to come up with a, um, a binaural intelligibility model for non-linearly non processed speech which is, uh, if that all works out, will be a very useful resource to us as internal processing to be able to develop lots of different you know, iterations of algorithms and work out which ones actually give meaningful improvements. So, we are at the end. Uh, we have seen that beamforming can reduce reverberation um, by using spatial selectivity. Um, but if it doesn't reduce reverberation from the loop direction. We've seen multi-channel equalization um, can achieve good deal of reverberation, but we're not yet at the point where we can apply it in the real world until we can get the blind system identification problem solved. And we've seen that linear prediction-based deal of reverberation can give good deal of reverberation and can also be processed after that to do noise reduction and the informing. And we looked at a few applications. Uh, References for all this stuff can be found in these two publications. This one will appear soon, or you can email me and I'll give it to you. Uh, these two books are really good. Uh, my boss wrote that one, and a collaborator uh, on the robots project wrote that one. And that's me. Okay, thank you very much.